Day 6, Tuesday, May 11, 1937, four weeks until the eclipse. The sea has smoothed out until there is hardly a ripple on it. The weather is delightful, not as I had supposed, and there is a wonderful breeze. We have not been doing bad. We have been doing a little better than ten knots since we left port, and we expect to sight Enderbury Island at about nine o'clock on the 13th. Tomorrow we cross the line and we'll have a shellback initiation. Everyone who has not been over the equator has already been handed a summons to appear in court. Mine states that I am charged with trying to pass yourself off as an AC Ducey player so that you could gain the good graces of the court. The Navy has its share of ceremonies and traditions that date back centuries in the western arena of the globe. The traditions followed by the Navy also find its mention in various mythologies. The ceremonies are often inspired by folklore and are performed as an act of paying tribute to King Neptune, the god of sea. A particular seafaring ceremony is known as the line crossing ceremony, which is performed with glory and boisterousness to celebrate the feet of the mariners who have crossed the equator for the first time. According to the colloquial terms allotted in the Navy, the mariners are divided into shellbacks and polywogs. The line-crossing ceremony is conducted as a sort of admittance into the court of Neptune. A seaman who is relatively new, or has not crossed the equator, is termed as a polywog. To be more precise with the colloquial term, the inexperienced mariners are termed slimy polywogs, who are not yet adept with the ways of the sea. On the other hand, the seamen who have crossed the equator are initiated as trusty shellbacks into the court of Neptune. The ceremony involves lots of physical activities that can be painful and tiring. The initiation is designed in a way to highlight the fact that the Navy shellbacks should be able to endure pain and deal with it like a proud mariner. The ceremony also instills a feeling of camaraderie, fun, and brotherhood among fellow seamen. There was the loveliest sunset this evening, such a play of colors on the sky and water I have never seen before. At sunset of the 11th, the ship was hailed by an unusual-looking individual who announced himself as Davy Jones a minister from the court of Neptune. He delivered a summons extraordinary subpoena moratorium from the royal court of the raging Maine to each of the landlubbers on board, requiring their presence the following day before the court of Neptunus Rex. Separate charges were preferred against each one. Everyone on board was subpoenaed except for about 17 old shellbacks who had crossed the equator before. They were all heartily greeted as old friends of Davy Jones. We spent a lot of time looking over the side trying to sight sea urchins. We saw a lot of Portuguese men of war. I had to stand a polywog watch on the foxhole from 10 to 11 this evening. Day 7, Wednesday, May 12, 1937. May 12 was hot and clear. Neptune's party came on board early and held court. Today is coronation day and also initiation day for the polywogs. A hearty breakfast and then ready for the initiation. The boys really put on a very good show on the poop deck, considering that they had such close quarters. With all the equipment of the astronomers, they had to improvise a tank right in the middle of all of the gear, and they did a very fine job. I was brought up before the judge, who was played by Dr. Mitchell, and was read off. The boatswain put me down on a bench, and they gave me a few shocks of electricity and then up a ladder. Before the fun started, the chaplain handed me a sympathy chip. I had to kiss the baby's stomach and drink some of the baby's milk of quinine water. And then, just as I was about to kiss the queen, she smeared my face with grease and graphite. Then, I was seated on a tilting chair and shoved in the tank. After Neptune and his court had been photographed by the geographics expert sharpshooter, they bade the captain goodbye and left the ship. The rest of the day was spent by the recently initiated in removing traces of the ceremony. Our genial artist, Michelangelo, Charles Bittinger, prepared to engross the diplomas for all the new shellbacks. Day 8. Thursday, May 13, 1937. Soon we had Enderbury Island close aboard on our port bow. That first view can never be forgotten by any of us. A very small, low isle with its few palm trees bent by the wind, its snow-white coral beach smothered in foamy breakers that rolled in continuously from nowhere and broke themselves with a loud roar on this shining shore. It was surrounded by crystal-clear water of the purest jade, in turn by the most dazzling blue, extending right out to the ship's side. Well, here we are at Enderbury Island. We sighted it at 6.38 a.m. this morning. We approached on the lee side, and after cruising up and down the length several times, we put over a small boat with lead lines and tried to find a suitable anchorage. Enderbury Island of the Phoenix Group was dead ahead, and we could see the landing place 
At 8.30 a.m., we were close to the island and cruised along the west side as far as the landing but found no anchorage with the water close to shore at 100 fathoms deep. The island evidently had no suitable place to drop the hook, so we got underway at 10.30 for Canton Island. At 1 p.m., we sighted Canton Island about 40 miles distant, and we came to anchor about 3 in the afternoon. We located an excellent anchorage just to the southward of the southern entrance to the lagoon. We saw a lot of sharks in the water. To make a conservative estimate, I would say that we saw at least a dozen in the two hours we were there. The island was rather a beautiful sight way out here in the middle of the Pacific. One could see an old stone landing that the guano diggers had used more than 50 years ago, and way down at the southern end, one could make out the ruins of four or five stone houses. Just over the edge of the shore, one could see a lagoon. There were myriads of frigate birds, terns, and boobies, and they came out and bid us welcome and bade us adieu as we left. There was excellent anchorage at the mouth of the lagoon on the west side of the island where the prevailing trade winds and the tidal currents would keep the vessel offshore in case the anchor was dragged with no steam in the boilers. We immediately sent the motorboat ashore to examine conditions in the lagoon. In the meantime, we were all curiously looking over the side, examining the bottom which, although ten fathoms down, was clearly visible. Soon after a boat was put ashore and the scientists and myself went ashore through a small entrance on the west coast, the lee side of the island. I myself have always believed 13 a lucky number, and so I was quite willing to be a member of a party of 13. Those who went ashore with the boatsmen must have run along the beach like school children picking up shells, for they all came back loaded with them. All kinds, from the most delicately colored rose tints to the beautiful marble white metallic blues and queer looking mixtures. The shapes were as varied as the coloring. I took my fishing line along and had five strikes in a quarter mile, but my hook was so small that they bent it straight and I was unable to land anything. The lagoon was a beautiful place and would be an ideal harbor for seaplane landings being well protected by a reef clear around. We went ashore after beaching the boat and across a tundra-like waste, which was the nesting grounds for these birds. They did not seem to be frightened by our intrusion and the females kept right on their eggs. There were many rats, but I don't think they'll cause the expedition any trouble. HMS Leith had been here some time before and left two tanks of water on which was written, NZ Total Eclipse Expedition, HMS Leith. On a sign nailed to one of the six palm trees and partially covered by bird droppings was the proclamation, This island is the property of His Majesty King Edward VIII. A lonely grave, protected by coral slabs turned on edge in the ground, tells of the death of one of the natives employed in the collection of guano. The two Hawaiian boys brought their water goggles and spears along and speared two mullets while we were over on the lee side of the island shore, looking for and at the gorgeous coral formations. There were millions upon millions of shells, and I shall bring back a good many of them. I also want to make a trip around the reef. When it was nearly time to return, I took off my jacket and shorts on the shore of the lagoon and put on the water goggles and put my head under water to see the beautiful marine life. There were many varied colored fish, small and large of the most beautiful blue, purple, red, yellow, green, and almost any color of the spectrum. When I came out, much to my chagrin, I found that I had been in swimming with my wristwatch on. Our return to the ship was uneventful, when we were all aboard, the men went out in the boat and in half hour's time had landed about ten fish, the largest of which was a tarpon-like creature which weighed twenty-four pounds. A small barracuda and the uluas made up the rest of the catch. Men were fishing over the side, too, and it was not unusual for the sharks to cut the fish in half before it could be landed. Some of the boys stayed up until ten o'clock with their lines over the sides. I'd surely hate to fall over the side because I think the sharks would make short work of an individual. To bed a little after ten, all tired out and with a severe headache. Those of us who remained on the Avocé enjoyed the most remarkable angling of our lives. The water was literally alive with fish. Schools of them could be detected by modifications of the ocean surface a half mile away, and when they approached the ship, we saw that they were all of a size and packed together like sardines. Projected above the surface of the water were the dorsal fins of many sharks. We had been told that the sharks were not particularly dangerous to a living person, and that if one came too near us while we were swimming, our proper procedure was to kick it in the nose. The fishermen immediately broke out their lines. 
In a very short time, fish of all colors and all sizes were being hauled in rapidly. They snapped at anything. The padre, Dr. McNally, hauled in a beauty only to see a shark snap off all but the head when it was practically alongside. The largest fish caught that night weighed almost 50 pounds. After about 30 minutes of sport that first afternoon, Dr. Paul McNally pulled out the head of a large fish which he had just hooked. A shark had bitten off 20 or more inches of the catch while it was being landed. Enthusiasm for kicking sharks in the nose was greatly dampened. The nose and mouth are too close together. Even in the lagoon, just off our wharf, we caught a five-foot shark on a line. When it was cut open, it had five baby sharks, one of which swam off when put in the water. Perhaps we should not have gone in swimming in the lagoon with so great danger from sharks so close at hand, but we took the precaution of not going far from shore and also of keeping a wary eye always for a disturbing fin. Even more dangerous than the shark was the stingray, also called the stingery. We saw this large, flat creature swimming horizontally, with its body perhaps six feet long and four feet wide, just below the surface, suggesting a floating blanket. Several were hooked at Canton, but none was pulled ashore. They swam very rapidly and could dispose their bodies to offer vigorous resistance when caught on a hook. Heavy hooks, specially forged on the ship, were used, but they always straightened out and released the fish. Apparently, we had anchored where the slope of the bottom was very steep, we picked up our anchor and drifted all night. Day 9, Friday, May 14th, 1937. Up at 7 this morning after spending a rather fitful night. The wind blew 30 knots hard that I was continually covering myself up. It wasn't cold, but one felt warm and comfortable with a sheet and spread over him. During the night, our anchor shifted and we started to drift, so steam was up in a jiffy, and the anchor pulled in and we circled back and forth until daybreak, and we came up and found a new anchorage. This time we stood farther in toward the reef and put the motor sailor over to sound ahead of the ship and to examine the bottom through a water glass. The men selected a spot in seven fathoms, which they buoyed after examining all around that locality. After breakfast, a group of the scientists and the men went ashore with equipment and supplies. The boatswain and the men built a nice dock on the lagoon side, and now supplies and equipment may be landed without any chance of getting things wet. The first board ashore took a full load of lumber and the float. By the time the second boat was loaded and had reached the lagoon, the boatswain had constructed his dock and the equipment could be passed over the side to the dock and skidded on rails clear of the beach. By early afternoon, we had landed seven boatloads of equipment and were ready to begin construction of the camp. This is WMES, WMES, RCA shortwave transmitter. Owned and operated by NBC, sending to RCA Point Reyes, California. This reception being put on the regular broadcast channels of NBC networks. We're now calling the United States. This is the United States Navy Avocet in the South Seas with the National Geographic Society Navy Eclipse Expedition. This is George Hicks speaking. We're now anchored at Canton Island. You last heard from us on Monday of this week. On Wednesday, we crossed the equator. On May 13th, Thursday at 6.30 a.m., Enderbury Island of the Phoenix Island Group was sighted, and we could see a cluster of five palm trees, and later the low green land and the green and white surf that rolled up at one point. Birds by the thousands arose from the island as we came in close. There was a shimmer of heat over Enderbury in the morning, and those five palm trees looked very much like the illustrations in a child's romantic storybook of a pirate's cone. We saw our first sharks there anchored or standing by off Enderbury, green back fellows about eight or ten feet long that came slinking along the ship and swung their bodies in sinuous curves and then sank again out of sight. We found no anchorage at Enderbury on Thursday, and we left for Canton Island, which is 35 miles west and north of Enderbury. It has an anchorage on the chart, and we went there to see if it would be better in Enderbury for our permanent camp. 1.15 on Thursday of this week, we sighted Canton Island, a long, low beach that stretched for miles on the horizon. 3 o'clock on that afternoon, the first boat went ashore through the lagoon, and our expedition landed on a South Sea island for the first time. Camp supplies, tents, nettings, camp chairs, shovels, pickaxes, sledges, Axes, tent poles, tuba poles, and little jerry are 
black dog mascot, Winnie Shaw, for the first time with supplies. At 11 o'clock, Dr. Mitchell, Dr. Gardner, Dr. Rick Meyer, and John Willis, with these supplies, will float, went ashore to pick up the astronomical site and decide on the campsite for the expedition. As we stand out on the gun deck of the Avocet now, we see the long, low shell of what makes Tenton Island. It's an atoll. And that is a ring shaped roughly about like a pork chop. Barely five feet or so in most places above the sea, and running in a great pork chop outline 27 miles around. It's really like a long circling sand spit with a bay in its pattern. Before our bow, a quarter of a mile away, is the entrance to this lagoon, like a river mouth between two beach ends, with the tide running out of it in ripples now. In the evening, it's now only 5.45, the evening here, halfway around the wall from you, the lagoon looks like a flat bay of dark blue with white caps on it and turquoise and green streaks through it, without swells and still with heat waves above it. It's uh, difficult to see clearly on land, even the short waves, because of the heat waves over the land. But the rim of the atoll shows like a low brown white line all the way around this lagoon. An occasional hump of sand or brush uh, shows above this strip. Before us, the surf rolls in through flat, greenish, bluish water, indescribable clearness, and crashes, crashes in white foam on the black and knotted rocks of coral. Above this beach, on the rise, which again slopes a few hundred yards behind to the lagoon beach, we see seven battered and wind-strained palm trees bent at us from the constant east wind against them. And under them, we now see seven brown, neat tents in a row. Time's up for the moment. Our next broadcast will be when we're established on the island, we hope, 4 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, 12 noon Pacific Time, over some stations of the NBC networks. May 6th, this Sunday. George Hicks speaking. This program is presented through the National Broadcasting Company. Canton Island is an atoll, a coral island with a lagoon in the center. It is shaped, as George Hicks described it in a broadcast, like a hollow pork chop. The strip of land is from 50 yards to a third of a mile in width. The distance around the lagoon, which is some nine miles long and three miles wide, is about 27 miles. The quiet stretch of water is almost encircled by the coral strip. On the island are two beaches. The one inside is a smooth stretch of sand sloping rather steeply to the lagoon floor. That facing the ocean is a narrow sand strip sloping downward to the fringing reef, which extends perhaps 200 feet from the shore and upward to a seawall of jagged pieces of coral, each larger than a football. Father McNally and myself and several of the boys were fishing over the side, and we caught about 20 red snappers weighing from 11 to 13 pounds. They certainly take a hold of your hook and start away, but they really don't offer much of a fight. I caught three and then called it a morning. Lieutenant Williamson cracked his head on a sand locker, and it necessitated one suture to close it up. My good captain has had some difficulty with his varicose veins, and I have had to keep him in bed with hot compresses of magnesium sulfate to relieve the swelling and edema. Everybody was fish crazy. Everybody chipped into a pool, and a fishing contest was started with daily and final prizes for the largest fish caught. By dinner time, everybody was tired, and we were willing to return on board and turn in, but not the fishermen. Oh, no. They fished long into the night. Only a few coconut palms have been hardly enough to survive the small rainfall. These formed a small cluster near where we camped, and under each tree there was the debris of fallen coconuts and broken-off leaves that had accumulated almost undisturbed over a period of years. The sparse grass is poorly rooted and has a dusty, bedraggled look such as is characteristic of the vegetation on mountains just at the timber line. Went over on the open seaside of the atoll and picked up a few pieces of coral and some shells. Dick Stewart, the National Geographic cameraman, and I took a walk along the lagoon beach for about half a mile to an old dock which had been constructed with large pieces of timber which must have measured 14 by 14 inches. One log was more or less decayed, and under it there were thousands of hermit crabs. They are a peculiar animal, in the struggle for existence, they have acquired the snail's shell for protection, and they walk around with the shell on top of them, and at the first warning of danger, they retreat into the shell. As soon as danger has passed, they emerge and keep on their way, dragging their shell with them. 
Even the small baby crabs get into a very small shell, and so throughout their life, they have a concrete roof for protection. Came back after being ashore for three hours, and it was very comforting to be back aboard ship where it was cool and shaded. One of the scientists, Dr. Rick Meyer from Cornell University, got a severe burn of the face, and believe me, he's got it. His face looks just exactly like a boiled lobster. The rats on the island were less amusing, although probably more plentiful than the hermit crabs. When we first arrived, they did not seem particularly numerous. As they became familiar with our refuse pile that accumulated near the mess tent, they increased in number until it appeared that they might have sent emissaries to summon all their fellows on the island. Millie, I have thought of you often and was wondering for the first few days how you were feeling. I haven't received any messages, so I suppose you are in the pink of condition. I wish you could have made this trip with me. Not exactly make the trip because after the first day of cruising life aboard ship got to be pretty monotonous. But now that we are here and apparently safely anchored, I wish you could see what a coral atoll looks like. I shall think of you often while we are here. Day 10, Saturday, May 15, 1937. Saturday morning, all hands were up bright and early. The supplies and gear continued to flow steadily, boatload after boatload, toward the beach. The rapidity with which our tent village grew was astonishing. Before we fully realized it, all tents were up. All cots were rigged, mattresses, pillows, and mosquito nets were in place. Meanwhile, others were rigging our big mess tent and our galley. The carpentering gang was busily sawing and hammering our one main structure together. Supplies were rushed to the mess shack, building material to the site of our town hall, radio equipment to the local radio city, and personal effects to the proper tents. Up at 7 o'clock and down to a good breakfast of ham and eggs, after which I took a turn at fishing over the side. Caught three nice big red snappers weighing 10 to 13 pounds each, and just as the fishing was getting good, a big shark came along and got my hook. He was a big fellow at least 8 feet long. I brought him in to the side of the ship but couldn't lend him, and during the tussle he broke my line and got away with the leader and hook. After that I quit and busied myself with a few minor ailments and injuries among the members of the crew. I sent the chief over to the beach to stand by in case of any accidents which might occur during the building of the shore establishments. I went over to the beach in the afternoon and made an exploration of the channel shore where an old ship had been wrecked a good many years ago. One could see pieces of metal covered by years of growth of coral. Rusting had gone on to such a stage that the pieces of iron were very light and very fragile. One could take what had been a three-inch bolt and break it over his knee. Back to the landing after several hours and for a swim off the dock with Captain Helweg and George Hicks. There were several sharks in the water and in close too, so one of us stood watch while the others were in the water. There was a very interesting episode on the beach by the channel when a man by the name of Gregson was casting into the stream found that his hook had fouled on a coral head, and he was just starting in to loosen it when just by chance he noticed a black shark about six feet long in the shallow water. Believe me, he certainly cleared out in a hurry. Swimming around with them on face in the water, I could scan all the wonderfully beautiful sights below, the white coral sand, the outcroppings of coral, odd and grotesque in shape and infinite in variety. Some of the formations were as delicate as fine lace. In and around them all were hundreds of gaily colored fish. They were not disturbed by our nearness, but went about their business, paying us scant attention. We would see a long, dark shape slowly working its way toward us, and we would scramble into shallow water. One evening, Hicks, a surf boy, and I were playing around a bug coral patch, watching the latest color scheme in gaudy fish. I had just veered toward the shore when Hicks yelled. Turning quickly, I saw not one black fin, but what looked like two large white ones. Charlie, the surf boy, had just gone under with his spear. Suddenly, the big blanket fish, for that is what it was, darted forward, its dangerous tail sweeping by. Hicks and I were practically out of the water. Charlie couldn't make it. One of the Hawaiian boys got a nasty coral cut and the back of both legs were badly abrased. I hope there won't be too much of that stuff.
Captain Helweg seems to be all right and his leg has come down to normal size after a couple of days of hot compresses and elevation. With much work and pleasant companions, time passed very quickly. After dark, we had no illumination other than barn lanterns, so we had plenty of time to watch the heavens. Our tents were pitched so that the opening at noon would be directed away from the sun and hence face the south. We had a chance to feast our eyes on what is perhaps the most beautiful part of the sky, namely the Southern Milky Way in the vicinity of the Southern Cross. I am as tired as a little boy who has played hard all day, so will be off to bed. We are going to have another radio broadcast in the morning. I hope you will be listening, Millie.